Our people uh, knew about the Blackstone and its radioactive uh, component. When the mining companies came in, the old people said, don't touch it, uh, otherwise you're going to get it. Or, those are the warnings of our people. Don't bother it, don't touch it, leave it alone. If you touch it and if you leave it, uh, if you touch it and if you start doing things with it, then you're asking for a world of hell. never imagined this would be my life. I imagined seven kids for some reason <laughs> and living on the reserve and driving the school bus and that was supposed to be my life. I was not supposed to be jumping all over the country and reading poetry and doing photography and capturing beautiful indigenous stories from coast to coast. And I love this life and I'm grateful for this life. But it's always about coming home. And English River is complicated and complex and political. Everything from some of the most beautiful beadwork and artisans that I know to tradespeople who have lived their entire lives working in the mine. This conflict isn't about Black Rock. This conflict is about how we show our love. Some of us will fight for the environment because we love the land. And some of us will fight for our right to have this job because we love our family. You know, we might not always agree. <laughs> we don't agree. Um, but we are from the same community and we are all living with the effects of this. The mines have allowed me to stay home, being around my family, my friends. Having a job for me up at the mines is everything. Being able to provide home base and putting food on the table, buying fuel. I want you backlit. I'm so sorry. Like right over here? Like right, like two steps. Okay. <laughs> Toby is... Oh, she's loud and has an amazing laugh, and everyone is just attracted to her light and her being. She brings joy to so much people around her. But she also works in a very man or male-dominated um, sector of work. She works in the mines, she has for years. And then she comes back and she'll wear her beautiful beaded bling or like her tank tops, or she'll leave her long hair undone and that is who she is, feminine and working in a male-dominated area. We don't see enough of that. We need to see more women who can walk both roles. <laughs> right now, I'm obviously kind of only shooting you from here up, but the sun is right behind you. You're kind of glowing. I want some hair in front. Leaving the North at 18 was important for me because of what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a writer. I didn't want to be a welder, I didn't want to work in the mines, I didn't want to work in a school or in a clinic. And that takes away a lot of branches within the North. It's just that dirty catch-22, the more educated you get in a field that isn't currently being fostered in the North, the further away from the North you get. At this time, I'd like to invite Daniel K. Campbell up to the podium. Love poem number 981. 16 and in love, walks around town, sneaks into back seats, beers by a bushfire, dark hickey seared onto body. Lacing our fingers together, smelling of damp night air and tobacco, picking the leaves out of my hair as you find our clothes bathed in moonlight. 
Nani tao, you say. Tati, I say. I love you. Me too. about memories. Mm. I met her in a dream. I, I dreamt about this, this young lady, this young girl who was peering at me through the willows and during those times. And they would let us out into the forest every Saturday to go, to go uh, rabbit snaring, to go picnic, to go swimming berry picking. So we did still enjoy those under the incarceration conditions that we were going to. But anyway. He was prepared to meet me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, he knew I was coming along. So that way I can say that's how I started. I met her. It was, like I said, <laughs> you stick around with this woman now from uh, now on. And, and that's what happened. Okay, um, this is a uranium core sample. It was a core sample that was found on the side of the road in, just in the ditch. And, and somebody thought, well, geez, that would be nice if I shellacked it and made a lamp out of it. And then uh, they got thinking, well, what would they be having core samples for f up here? And the only thing really is uranium. And so to be safe, rather than sorry, after the fact, they decided to get it to somebody they knew might be able to get it to somebody who could take readings. So it's 586 counts per minute. And like I said, that's, that's close to double what we usually see for regular air, normal background radiation giving off right on gas. So we wouldn't want to have it in anybody's house. It, it could be a health hazard over time to the people that are exposed to it. Okay, this is the other one. Hello? We've reached out to all kinds of organizations um, to try and help us do a health study on our own. So we've done things to try and and gather information. What we've done is set up a whistleblower's hotline so that miners um, who feel that their, their, li their lives have been put at risk in the mines, they can call in and not have to worry about being blacklisted because that happens when you complain at the mines. It's necessary because they have no avenue. They have no avenue to address their concerns either. Uh huh. Yes, and I've been there for 18 and a half years. Yeah. And all the going on and everything was not great. The stories I've heard from the miners who have blown the whistle, there is so much that they are being exposed to. There's basically, you know, people are afraid. Afraid to go against the companies. Afraid because there's no jobs then. Afraid there's no grants for their schools and their high, and and their. They're just so bogged down and influenced by these these mining companies that it's it's taken over what. Doing what's right. So after a decade of shooting beautiful indigenous souls, 
still having the opportunity and the trust to come into my own community and shoot my people, be it ex-loves to favorite uncles to favorite cousins and having them trust me, that, that is joy. That is my light. So I picked my uncle JB, who I knew was a great storyteller and I knew would have some insight and some overarching ideas against he lives in the community, he speaks the language, he has been in this community before there's minds. And I think that's important. Woo! Whoa! Don't break my trail. Don't break your trail. <laughs> you know what? You're critical, <laughs> but you're old. I'll let you get away with it. Hold on. My earliest memories of uncle are with a fish in hand, are coming in, smelling of fish, smelling of burnt duck, smelling of nature. Well, back in 70s, there was no mining yet. I used to trap and fish. I did that till I started working in Clough Lake. But it was, it's hard work when you're living off the land because you never know if you're gonna kill anything or something. Huh? It's a gamble you take. Well, the young ones now, it'd be hard just to, they wanna teach them the way we live. Their future is in the school, younger generation. They're not gonna learn anything in a week for to survive in the bush. <laughs> Uncle! <laughs> you're supposed to help me, okay? Yeah! Follow my tracks, you're gonna be okay. I got, <laughs> I got gear, I can't get wet. <laughs> These boots aren't mine. Woo! <sighs> you're ruthless. Yeah, when, uh, they don't know how to live in the, in the wildlife. That's what I know happens. how to order a latte. When you look back, you look at everything. I grew up here. A lot of changes. I was taught by my late dad, his name is Philip Wolverine. He taught me the roots of from boating, canoeing, how to set a trap, how to set a fox snare, right down to how to shoot a duck. The well-being of the work is up in Northern Saskatchewan that work into the mining system. You guys be careful up there. It's a lot of contamination. Oh, I, sometimes I feel just, I don't feel the way I breathe and stuff. Till this day, my health, I haven't really looked into it yet, but some other people in my community, some are getting sick of cancer. Some of them were, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's our water. We were concerned about all the cancer rates going up here. Oh, there's a lot of people. Sometimes I just worry about what they're going through. This is the map from our, this is our traditional territory. This is where we all go hunting and trapping all the way from Pine Hills all the way to Key Lake. We go through the mine. Right now, there's a lot of caribou up in Key Lake Road. But I don't know if they even tested animals up there. Oh yeah, one time there was a caribou in a tailings pond. I forget what year was that. It was in the spring. They just took that caribou out of that tailings and let him loose. There was a lot of cuts and bruises on that caribou, I remember. I wonder if they even reported that, I was wondering. Because I'm pretty sure that caribou was contaminated. I'm pretty sure there was it right in the tailings pond. Happy. We're smiling, we have teeth. Uncle. <laughs> I'll spit on you if you don't shut up. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, I love it. You look like an old elder. Hello. All right, let's get you warm. Well, exposures to uranium, it's a, it's a deadly thing, I guess, uranium. Huh? At this, people from here will benefit uh, to get a job. So they can't really say too much, huh? Because if they say too much, they might not get a job, huh? 
they say, uh, they say, which is not true, all these things. They hide them, uh, they make it look like it's clean. I seen it, but I don't want to say too much about it. If the mining goes, I don't think it'll be any good for anybody. Because that's what they rely on. Huh? Once a mine closed, and they take out your uranium and everything, that'll be the end of it. It's just that it'll be something like a uranium city, ghost town. Though. Mining is not going to last forever. It's going to go down once they take out everything. We'll be in a big hole once they take out everything. <laughs> the earth will cave in. <laughs> Mines have been a part of my life, whether I see it or not. They help provide for my family. The North is not a utopia. We know this. We live, for the most part, under the poverty line. We're underfunded. Treaties aren't honored. Education systems sometimes lack. All these little things come into play. <laughs> Effects of colonization, we say. But there are things that predate that. The land is still indigenous land. We still have the skills and the abilities and the languages we had before contact. These are the things that bring me home time and time again. Um, I chose my ex because we have been together since I was 17. And just because we broke up, it doesn't that mean we stopped being a family. So he's one of the most important people in my life, along with our daughter. And for him, he has always worked in the mines. The mines, it's, it's okay. But it's just pushing through it, it kind of helps. And knowing that I'll be supporting my daughter and my mom and mostly just what I'm working is mostly for her, so her well-being, so she can actually grow and not worry about anything sometimes. But. Our past, like the mines have always been a part of it because he's been a welder, he's worked with his hands, that's where he's trained, and that's where he's been sent, that's how he's provided for us when we were together, that's how he's provided for our daughter when we're apart, even when we got married. The next day you flew out to the mines, remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was like that kind of immediacy of you know, we can have these joyous celebrations because of this job, but that there's still sacrifice. Because who goes to the mines for two weeks after you get married? If you gotta work, that's what you do. Right there is perfect, yeah. Holding hands. I, when I was in the mines, I, I used to be on uh, a lot of committees, like we had an environment committee, and I mean, I, I never heard of any any pollution going into the, the, the lakes or the rivers or anything like that, so. Like everything we do, it's through guidelines. And to tell, to tell you honest, truth, there's always there's always pros and cons to everything that happens. I mean, any, any development that happens, not only in the north here but ev around the world. Eh? So you, you're going to hear all kinds of uh, negative input, and it's it's the media that makes it, things look bad. Eh? You know, like we have we have uh, Aboriginal people that are environment technicians and radiation technicians that, you know, they make sure that they, they're part of the team and they're, they're protected. Eh? The livelihood in North got better as the mines came in. It was good. Like, it paid for a lot of things for us. It uh, provided us with our children's education. Our, our livelihood got better. There's my grandchildren, this is all family. Like, you think about it, they mean the world to me. My world rotates around my family. It's not, it's not just anything else. It's, when you see them smile, they just make your day. So we still go up to the mines, we still, area, we still go to our culture camp. And part of my job is to take children up there and I show them, there's the mine. And this is where we're going to live. This is where we're going to survive. 
in 2002, we saw that a lot of our students were starting to drop out of the public school. Um, Marius had developed a program through social services to get them to get some working and living skills. After that, he and the then CEO of, of education in English River put together a proposal to start the home front school. The last notes of our students are still on the board. It's like ghosts of what we were working on and things that were not quite finished. The, uh, <clears throat> the reason for having started a, a project like this was to realign, restructure, reorient a new learning strategy for a lot of the students who were enduring colonialism. And, and to really form them and relate, help them form a relationship to the land the way that, you know, the people originally had that connection with the land and let the land teach the children, not structured instruction out there. We actually started this school because our kids were expected to go to school in the village, in the public school. And a lot of them were experiencing problems. There is conflict between treaty and Métis. A lot of them were dropping out. Once we started this school, there were no more dropouts. So, you know, the students had strong feelings about what's going to be good for our future generations. They want other opportunities, not just uranium mining. Speaking against the uranium industry and the nuclear waste management industry definitely has consequences. You kind of get blackballed from everything. Well, after the collaboration agreement was signed in 2013, and we had, uh, we were very vocal at that, against it. Within a day, one working day, we had received a letter stating that our school was going to be shut down as of June 4th. We're no longer uh, a band of First Nation. We're a mining town. There is ugliness if you look for it. And trust me, enough people will point it out for you. But for me, the challenge is not in seeing the ugly, but seeing the damage and seeing how I can work to better the situation, to better myself, to strengthen the next generation. How do we make the changes we need to make in order to be a better ancestor? companies that are here did not follow what we know, what our ancient people have always done to preserve the life support system for the future people. That there is no such thing as a resource. It is always the Earth Mother. The Earth is not a resource in the sense of a commodified, <clears throat> concept, then it profanes, then it creates illnesses, it creates a lot of, a lot of imbalance. I don't generally see myself as any type of person that, that protests, uh, that gets to the, into the attention of, of the, their goons and their authorities. That, I've walked through <clears throat> a lot of the, the violence that's, that's part of the uh, response. You know, we don't protest, we respond. You know, it's like the old the, uh, Star Wars mechanism, <laughs> the Jedi. This is my land. <clears throat> that's all I can say. 
I don't normally speak on topics like this because it's complicated. I see both sides. But more importantly, I see the people on both sides. The history, the connections, both to the community and the land. There's no easy answer, no easy solution. I just try to remember the personal responsibilities I have within these issues and to move forward in a good way.